two places if you turn in Scripture, Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 13. I appreciate the notice that was given at Camp Dove last week was Sister Hurst and our family's 20th year anniversary of being here in uh, Union Pentecostal Church. One person said, 20 years? I thought it was a lot longer than that. But it's just been 20 years. And uh, we appreciate that uh, notice that was given. And I I thought the roast was uh, humorous, too. But I almost, after that, I, I, I almost feel really bad to announce this Sunday morning that we are beginning a new series. <laughs> if you were there, you'll know what that's about. But with intrepidation, I announce that. I believe, and I'll be saying this in another way in a moment, I believe what we need in these times more than anything is the teaching of Jesus himself we need to hear from the master teacher could you stand for the reading of God's word Mark chapter 4 and verse 30 Jesus said wherein shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it with this Jesus introduces a parable. The parable's purpose was to have something to which liken the kingdom of God and to compare the kingdom of God. And then in Matthew chapter 13, the parable chapter, begin reading at verse 34. All these sayings spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake not he unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. The series we're going to open is the parables of Christ. And back in Mark chapter 4 and verse 30, he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? of God. To talk about parables, we must start right there. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. I want to preach this morning simply on this. In introducing these parables, I want to preach on the kingdom. The kingdom. Father, help us. Shut up our minds to the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to hear eternal things. Lord, there's someone here in this service that desperately needs an answer. Someone that desperately needs saved and delivered. Lord, I believe in the power of your word. That your word can be present to save and present to heal and present to deliver. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, anoint us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As I have already pronounced by the reading of the text, you cannot talk about the parables without talking about the kingdom. But you cannot talk about the kingdom without also talking about the king. (laughs) Worship the king. Most of us are aware we're in this debacle of this debt crisis, raising the ceiling of the debt and all that's been going back and forth in Washington this week and you've heard it and read it in the news but you know something I've heard from those on both sides of the aisle irrespective of political parties the drumbeat I've been hearing from folks is I wish someone would just be a leader how many's heard that and all this I wish somebody from both sides I wish somebody would be a leader and show some leadership well I want to announce to us church this morning in reminding us we have a leader we are those who serve a mighty king we have a king and I'll tell you what he is going to lead us through this 
I don't know if they believe me over here. I'll be back. I said, we have a king, and he is going to lead us through. I don't know all we're going to be facing. I know it's pretty tough out there right now. But I want us to remind us this morning, we have a king, and we are part of a kingdom that's on the move. We're a part of the kingdom that is going to be victorious. We are part of the kingdom that will overcome. If you're glad to be a part of the kingdom, why don't you lift your hand and say, Hallelujah to the king. Hallelujah. These parables are about the kingdom. The real reason I talk about the kingdom this morning is because together, Lord willing, we are going to explore the parables of Christ. Now I know, I know, I've already been through it. I've been through it with myself. The parables of Jesus on an evangelistic Sunday morning. Isn't that a little teachy? For a Sunday morning, parables of Jesus on Sunday morning. Don't lift your hand, but some of you were thinking that when I announced it. And so I've been through that. I mean, isn't that just a little bit teachy? You know, parables are such a central part of Jesus' teaching. My question is, how can Jesus' teaching not be teaching? But if Jesus' teaching is teachy, and it is, it ought to be all right to be teachy. And teachy must be what me be what we really need. <laughs> You'd laugh at me if I came to the conclusion that teachy is peachy. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's what we need. We need the teaching of Christ. In a new way. To enunciate that, I want to remind us that one third of all Christ's teaching was in the form of parables. One third of all that Christ has taught us was in the form of parables. Jesus was not afraid to teach, and he uses a vehicle of his teaching. He used the parable. Why? Because the parable was designed to show truth to all that desired it and hide truth from all who did not. I said, Jesus, by his own mouth, said that he used parables to reveal truth to those that wanted truth and to hide truth from those that do not want it. I'm not trying just to, to say this as a strong arm tactic but I want you to know I believe it is the truth what I'm fixing to say those that really want the truth are hungering for the teaching of Christ and those who do not want the truth simply down deep are going to be bored by it and uninterested but I believe there is a group of people whose hearts are touched by the Holy Spirit that says, more than anything, I want to hear what thus saith the Master Teacher. And the majority of what he had to say came through parables. Matthew 13, 34, I read to you, Jesus spake unto the multitudes in parables, and without out a parable spake he not unto them. Every time he spoke to them, he used a parable. The word parable very literally means to throw something alongside of something else. And that's what Jesus was doing when he shared a parable. He took the reality of life that people knew and he put it alongside the reality of spiritual things they did not know so that they could understand the spiritual things that they needed to understand. And so here is the truth of the kingdom, the spiritual things. People haven't got it yet. So right beside it, he throws down a reality of their everyday living so they can take what they do know and do understand look at it look at the spiritual truth and say oh I get it hallelujah have you had those moments when God got to talking to you and all of a sudden you just had to say oh I get it now amen oh that's what I want the Lord to do by the Holy Spirit to my heart and our hearts so it's to begin to talk to us till suddenly we're saying and ever serving I get it Lord I understand it Lord hallelujah oh it's clear to me now Lord 
That's what he was doing with the use of parables. I remember when Windows first came out, and I'm not an expert by any means, but I was trying to help some older people understand Windows. And so I began to compare it to my study, and I compared the hard drive to my shelves of books that are there. Now, you know, the ROM, I began to talk about that's how many books you can open up, how much space you, on my desk I can ha- have to open up books all at one time. I said, that processor is like me. If I got a slow processor, it's like me moving slowly to my bookshelf and slowly pulling a book out and slowly open it up. But I said if I have a fast processor, it's like I jump out of my chair. And anyway, I was using something they understood to try to explain to them something that was new. But I want us to know, amen, Jesus, when he shared the parables, it wasn't just interesting stories with the surprising twists and a suspenseful plot. When he shared the parables, he wasn't just sharing an interesting story that was going to be good to share in children's Sunday school class but that people outgrow when they get to the higher grades. You know, some people have left the parables way back there in the children's Sunday school class. No, sir, those parables were for everyone and when Jesus shared a parable, that parable literally was a capsule of life-changing truth. Hallelujah. A parable was a capsule of reality a parable was a capsule of a story that within it had a truth that would revolutionize the hearer's life. Oh, how many knows we need a revolution, amen, from church folks to unsafe folks. We need a revolution. A parable was a capsule of reality that had the truth that would revolutionize a life. And so Jesus would take the reality around people, amen, to talk about the reality that could be within people. Amen. These parables are not Dr. Seuss. They're not veggie tales. Amen. We've taken the parables of Christ out of the children's Sunday school and fed them on veggie tales. Hallelujah. You know, it's made parents a nervous wreck. Amen. What's it going to do to our kids? Amen. I'm not preaching against veggie tales. I'm just saying Jesus already had the answer. Amen. He had these life changing stories. They're not Aesop's fables, they're not fairy tales, but the parables are about real people in real situations doing real tasks with real things. And Jesus uses the real things of the seen world to illustrate the real things of the unseen world. I hear it as a mantra anymore. Let's get real. Let's get real. If anybody got real, it was Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you glad for a Savior that knows how to get real with us? And that's what the parables were all about. Even I want to answer just a few questions this morning or attempt to. But why are we talking about the kingdom if we're talking about parables? Because parables, the whole point of parables was to get across to we the people the truth about Christ's kingdom. Every time Jesus used a parable, he was trying to get across to people, amen, the truth about his kingdom. Jesus' message, his gospel, his good news was all about the kingdom. Amen. You know, we, the people, I'm not talking about us particularly, but as church people, we've made this thing about something else. We've made it about parties. We've made it about entertainment. We've made it about performance. Amen. We've made it something else. But for the Lord, this thing about church, this thing about being saved, this thing about eternal life, this thing about being born again was about the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't need a third party. Amen. We need the kingdom of God to be the kingdom of God. And we'd have a revival that would bring revolution. Amen. Jesus preached the kingdom. Before Jesus, John the Baptist came preaching. What was his message? Matthew 3, 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What was he preaching? And saying, repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus began his ministry. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 9, 2. And he sent his disciples to preach what? 
Prosperity, how to have a new home, amen, how to reach their full potential. No, he sent the disciples to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I'll get to it maybe in a moment. Why heal the sick? Because every time a sick person's healed, it advances the kingdom. Hallelujah. Not only does a sick person get relieved, but every time a sick person gets healed, it advances the kingdom. Hallelujah. And he told his disciples to go and preach the kingdom. What did they do after Christ ascended and the Holy Spirit fell? Acts 8, 12. But when they believed Philip, what was Philip preaching? He was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. They were baptized, both men and women. I believe our message in 2000, 2011 and 2012 coming up. Amen. Our message needs to be the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's where our allegiance is this morning, isn't it? Amen. Amen. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but we're here this morning, amen, as subjects of the king. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I hope this gets a hold of our hearts this morning. It's about the kingdom. A second question I want to try to answer. What is the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Some people get confused. You read all through Matthew, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. You get to the other gospels, it's kingdom of God. Well, sometimes in a very small amount of cases, there is a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But the majority of time, there is no difference between the usage of the phrase kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. Why then did Matthew use them so much? Amen. I'll talk about that in a moment, but I want to show you how they're used synonymously. Mark 4, verse 30. And he said, Whereunto shall we like the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? He goes on to say, It is like a grain of mustard seed. That's Mark. We go to Matthew 13, 31. Another parable he put forth unto them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. So Mark and Matthew are referring to the same occasion, the same moment, the same parable. But Mark uses kingdom of God and Matthew uses kingdom of heaven. Let me show you one more instance. Luke 13, 20. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? Verse 21, It is like leaven. But back in Matthew 13, 33, another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven. Same occasion, amen, same parable, and yet Matthew says kingdom of heaven, and Luke says kingdom of God. Amen, what is the difference? Here's the difference. Matthew was writing primarily to the Jews. The Jews had such reverence to Jehovah of God and they took so seriously the commandment not to take the name of the Lord God in vain that they were always very reluctant to speak or to write the name of God. I mean, it was so important to them that when the scribes were copying the scripture, every time they came to the word God that they were going to have to write down in the copy, they would get up, they would go to a place, unclothe themselves, wash their whole body, put on new clean garments, get a brand new quill and sit down and write the one word God get up and go through the process again after writing his name of washing their bodies and changing their clothes and get a new quill. I mean they were that concerned about not abusing the name of God by becoming over familiar with it. And so because of that the Jews began to put something in the place of the name of God so they wouldn't have to overuse the name of God. And so when they wanted to talk about God, they would often just say heaven in the place of God so they wouldn't overuse his name. If you want the technical name, that's circumlocution. Now some of you can sleep better tonight now that you got the technical term for it. Circumlocution. Amen. Even the king. Did you know they still do that sometimes? Sometimes instead of saying President Obama said today, we'll, we'll say this. We'll say the White House 
said today. Instead of talking about President Obama's policy, we'll say the White House's policy. They did not. I do appreciate their concern about not abusing the name of the Lord. Can you say amen? And so because of that, when Matthew wrote to the Jews, he put heaven there instead of God not to overuse the name of God. Hallelujah. I know taking the name of the Lord in vain means and refers to cussing and cursing and blasphemy. But I think we can also take his name in vain in other ways. I mean, people, you know, just as an expression, say, oh my God. And we just take his name in vain. That's not the message here. I'm just explaining why Matthew used heaven instead of God. So basically, they are the same. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. What is the kingdom? I hope I don't oversimplify this, but a kingdom is a domain where something is dominant. It's a domain where something or someone is dominant. You know, to have a kingdom, you've got to have several things. You've got to have a king. You've got to have a territory. You have to have subjects, and you have to have law. I'm telling you, God's got a kingdom. Right here is His law. And ever born again believer is a subject and his territory is the hearts of men and women and children and the king is Christ himself oh the kingdom of God hallelujah amen but let me in danger of being oversimplifying let me just define it this way the kingdom of God is wherever God is king the kingdom of God is wherever God is king I'm telling you if God brother Mark, if God is king of your heart, there is the kingdom of God. If God is king in this church, this is the kingdom of God. If God is king in your home, that is how your home is the kingdom of God. If God is king in your marriage, amen, your marriage is the kingdom of God. If God is king in your mind, your mind is the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, God's kingdom is wherever God is king. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be a part of the kingdom? It's about the kingdom. Listen to me. To be saved isn't just to get fire insurance, just to be set free, just to be rehabilitated, just to get a better high than drugs. To be saved, Brother Keith, is to become a servant and a loyal subject and an obedient follower of the King. To get saved, to become genuinely born again, is to become a part of the kingdom as an obedient subject of the King. To be a part of the church isn't just to belong to a flash mob or a social club. It's not just to have a place to go for therapy and a spiritual massage and an emotional pleasure fix. Amen. Church is the place, amen, where those come, subjects come together, the subjects of the kingdom that do the work of the kingdom, the subjects that advance the kingdom, the subjects that expand the kingdom, the subject that fights the battles of the kingdom. We are here this morning to see the kingdom of God expand. I'm telling you, somebody gets saved this morning because folks were praying. Folks were behind the preaching. Folks got in and worship. If somebody gets saved this morning, we have served our purpose for coming. We have advanced the kingdom of God. The territory of His rule has expanded. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God. Amen. Quickly, just a few more questions. What is the church to the kingdom? You keep talking about the kingdom, but what about the church? Again, in the danger of being oversimplistic, the church is the army of the kingdom on earth. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. How many here is a part of the church of Jesus Christ? Lift your hand. You know who we are this morning? We are the army of the kingdom on earth. Hallelujah. We like to sing that. Amen. But we are that. We are that. What is the church? It's the gathering of the subjects of the kingdom to hear from the king. That, uh, what's his name? Prince William, is that who he is? He and his new wife, 
That crowd of hundreds of thousands gathered just to watch him come out on a balcony, wave at him, and kiss his new bride. But that was in tradition of when folks knew the king was going to speak. They would gather in and press in together and wait until the king came out on the balcony and address them. Every time we come together as the church, we need to think to ourselves, we are the subjects of the king. We have gathered together to wait for him to step out on the balcony of heaven and as king, as our king, address us as his subjects. The church is a gathering of the subjects of the kingdom. The church is the company of the ambassadors of the kingdom. Paul said we are ambassadors of this kingdom. When we leave those doors as the church, we leave as the ambassadors of Christ. Hallelujah. To share His kingdom to a lost and a dying world. Oh, hallelujah. What I've just shared with you is a far cry from how being a Christian and being a part of the church is viewed today. I'm not trying to be critical, but today Americans Christian has made being a Christian all about me, all about personal prosperity, personal advancement, personal care, personal feelings, personal entertainment. That's what American Christians have made Christianity. Christianity has become all about what God can do for me, how God can serve me, how God can better me. And you know, that isn't recognized. That message isn't recognized for what it is. But it's an idolatrous message that puts the focus on sin. Amen. Just another way to try to advance and prosper self. And I believe that's why so many churches, so many groups are catering to people's preferences, catering to people's desires. Amen. Catering to their desire for entertainment rather than preach the truth to them. They've made it about the person. I want you to know, yes, God loves the individual. Yes, God wants to help the individual. Yes, God wants to lift the individual. Amen. But getting saved isn't just about me. It's about the kingdom. It's about the one that's still lost. It's about the one that's perishing. It's about the one that needs delivered. Amen. And my desire as a member of the church should be see, to see the kingdom of God advance. Hallelujah. Christianity for the Christian is in fact about the kingdom of God. It's not about God serving me. It's about me serving God. The kingdom isn't about God helping me fulfill my plans, my potential, my agenda. It's about my being a part of fulfilling His plan, His agenda. Let me let you in on a little secret. When I'm fulfilling His plan, I will be reaching my potential. Amen. When I make it about His agenda, I will be fulfilled and prosper in the kingdom. Now listen, I'm going to bring this together in a moment. Listen to me carefully. I believe what I just shared with you is why so many Christians are so ill-satisfied, they're so discontent, they're so little involved. I believe it's because modern Christianity has reinforced to them that being a Christian is about them. Simply a way to help them, better them, prosper them. You know what that does when we make it about me? It takes away the greatest liberator of self. It takes away the greatest sense of purpose we can have. It takes away the greatest fulfillment that we could have in ourself. And that is to live for something that's bigger than me. Hallelujah. But when it's about the kingdom, I'm living for something bigger than I am. I now have a sense of purpose. I have a reason to live. I'm a part of something big, really big. You know, those that start those Ponzi schemes, they always come, I'm going to let you in on something big. But you got to do it today. You got to sign it. I'm going to let you in on something big. I'm telling you, when Jesus let you into the kingdom, you got in on something big, really big. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I said hallelujah how many's glad to be a part of the kingdom it's not about me I'll never be fulfilled that way it's about being a part of something where my ever action my ever effort is going to amount to something and the advancement of the eternal kingdom of God amen we have been born again to advance the kingdom well what about those other things what about my job my house what about those other things Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these sayings shall be added unto you. If you'll seek the kingdom, the advancement of the kingdom, it'll take care of your relationship problems. It'll take care of your financial problems. It'll take care of your job problems if you'll seek first the kingdom of God. Oh, hallelujah. One more question. Why is the kingdom of God so hard at times to understand if it's so simple? You keep saying it's simple, pastors. Why is it so hard at many times to understand? Now, I, I say this just to let you know. I'm bringing it down to about a minute or two minutes worth. But I spent a lot of time going, re, going through the Gospels again and looking at every occurrence of the kingdom of God to try to get a grasp of this. So I'm not sharing the Scriptures that would take too much much time but I just want you to know the statements that I'm about to make they come from researching the scripture and it's there the kingdom of God seems complex sometimes because it's a paradox it is so simple and it's complex what are you talking about pastor well you see the kingdom of God it's on earth but it's in heaven at the same time those that are around the throne of God worshiping right now they're as much a part of the kingdom of God as brother Lee sitting on this pew so the kingdom of God is on earth and it's in heaven the kingdom of God is already here and yet it's coming Jesus said if I cast out demons by the finger of God then is the kingdom come unto you Every time a demon comes out, the kingdom of God has come. Every time someone comes to this altar and surrenders their heart and life to Jesus, the kingdom has come. Every time somebody gets healed, the kingdom has come. Every time you sense the presence of the Holy Ghost, with ever moving of the Holy Ghost, the kingdom has come. Yet, we haven't begun to see what's coming because the kingdom is also coming. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come. We know, Sister Karen, it's already here, and yet we're desiring for it to come in greater eternal measure. And so the kingdom's here, it's coming. It consists, the kingdom consists of those living, and it consists of those who have already departed. How many is here? and you're born again, and you're breathing, lift your hand. Now that's kind of moot, because if you're not breathing, you can't lift your hand. Thank you. You are the kingdom of God. But I want you to know, we've had a lot of services for our saints around here, and we've buried them in the ground. But I want you to know, we might have buried them in the ground, but they sat down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom. <laughs> And so we that are alive, we're the kingdom. But those that have departed to be with the Lord, they're in the kingdom too. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Humor me. Just shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. The kingdom is what the believer is in, but it's also what's in the believer. Amen. You can stand as a born again person this morning and say, I'm in the kingdom. And you're speaking in the truth but the only reason you can say you're in the kingdom is because the kingdom is in you you're lifting your hands and you're reaching out and saying I'm worshiping I'm seeking the king and the whole time the king's right inside oh what a what a marvelous thing amen the kingdom is invisible and yet it's visible I look at you if you're born again I, I look at this church brother Brock and I'm seeing the kingdom of God oh but the kingdom of God is also invisible I don't want to spook you but we just saying we are standing on holy ground angels all around I ain't seen I, I hate I hate to disappoint you I'm not I'm not being derogatory but I look at the congregation and I, I don't think I see any angels it got quiet. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you are. 
that doesn't mean they're not here, Brother O'Hare. Because the kingdom of God is seen and it's unseen. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't physically see the Holy Spirit this morning, but He was here. The kingdom was here. Amen. The kingdom can be taken from a person, and a person can be taken out of the kingdom. Oh, what a warning. Don't have time to preach that. The kingdom must be entered into. Jesus said how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. But not only must a person enter into the kingdom, but the kingdom must enter in to a person. I'm telling you, when you got born again, the king stepped into your heart, and he desires to reign from the throne of your inner self, your inner being. Amen. The kingdom comes to a person and yet a person must seek it. Amen. You, you've perhaps even this morning had the kingdom come to you. God spoke to you. God moved on you. That was a kingdom coming to you. And yet Jesus says, seek the kingdom. And so that's why it's a bit difficult. It's a paradox. But that does not mean it's not real. The kingdom of God is wherever God is king. It's wherever God's laws are acknowledged and follow. It's where God God is honored and uplifted and reverenced. That is the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And where the kingdom of God is. I'm summarizing now. Amen. The kingdom is wherever God is king. But where the kingdom is, there'll be an invasion in the eternal world. Where the kingdom is, the power of God will be made manifest. Where the kingdom is, the presence of God will be felt. Where the kingdom is, lives will be changing. People will be being set free. Allegiances will be altered. Even where the kingdom is, there's saving. There's healing. There's delivering. Even where the kingdom is, there is help. There is hope. There is strength. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, God is where He is. Is the kingdom. And where the kingdom is, that's when we get what we so desperately need. I mentioned William and Kate just a moment ago. All that interest about a future figurehead king. And I'm not tearing him down as a person. I'm just saying the great crowds for just a, for just a figurehead, a monarch. And yet that, that interest of the crowd shows to me that people are still interested in having a king. Their affections and allegiances may be ill-founded, but it shows they have a desire for a king. Could I say, we have a king. And I think people want to hear the message that there is a king in control in our chaotic world. I think people want to hear the message that there is a king to whom our actions matter. Our lives matter. I think people want to hear that there is a king with a plan, with an agenda, with an army who can protect and provide. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God, though simple to become a part of. Yes, it can be complex and its realities. And therefore, Jesus spoke in parables to take the complexity of the kingdom and make its reality real to our hearts. I've said all that, but in closing, I want to enunciate just a little bit of the preaching of the gospel with three quick things. Number one, we belong to one of two kingdoms. There is no third kingdom. How many believes what I'm going to tell you? There is no third kingdom. Every person sitting and hearing this message today or listening to it on the internet, every person belongs to one of two kingdoms. Jesus said in Matthew 6 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. No third alternative, no third choice. We're either in the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. I love you young people, but Jesus' words are true. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be a part of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light at the same time. So just make up your mind. I'm going to be in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. All this stuff that can go on and transpire in a young person's life. Just make up your mind. Amen. Being saved isn't about getting a good feeling and staying off of drugs. That alone. It's about being an important part. A soldier in the kingdom. It's not old heads like me that 
that advance the kingdom. It's young people getting uh, on fire for God and realizing it's more than just about them and their little problems. It's about being a part of something that's huge. It's about the kingdom of God that rescues from the perishing, that plucks people from the very grasp of hell's fire. Amen. You could turn that neighborhood upside down. You could have revival at your public school when you realize it isn't just about me, but it's about my being a part of the army of the kingdom and the kingdom advancing wherever I am. Secondly, no longer there just one or two kingdoms. We must be supernaturally delivered from one kingdom and inserted into the other. You can't just say, I'm going to change my life with my own power, my own ability. You can't say, I'm just going to change my regime or change my, my, my habits or change my diet and, and, and become a part of God's kingdom. It's a supernatural thing that must happen in a person's heart. I read it in our worship scriptures this morning. But Paul said in Colossians, giving thanks to the Father, he's made us saint, partakers of the inheritance of saints and I. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. He delivered. You just don't say, I'm leaving Satan one day and walk in and become a part of the kingdom of God. Because Satan ain't going to let you go that easy. You can't just say, I'm tired of sin. I'm going to get rid of all these habits and all this bondages on my own. I can do it. I'll just realize, I'll be true to myself, realize my potential, and then I can succeed at anything I put my mind to, and I'm just going to leave all this behind and become a child. You cannot do it on your own power. It takes the supernatural power of God to release you from that kingdom of darkness and to translate you into the kingdom of of his dear son but the good news is that power is available there's not a person he can't rest from the hold of sin and Satan and darkness and just bring them into the kingdom oh hallelujah anyone that would reach out to the Lord and say I want that to happen to me he would send all the resources of heaven, all the divine power of the Holy Spirit. He would set in motion every angelic army and he would march into the territory of Satan and set you free, pick you up, and carry you and put you down into the kingdom of God. Oh, hallelujah. If it happened to you, lift your hand and praise the Lord that he has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. Last of all, we of the kingdom should be absorbed in worshiping and serving the king of the kingdom. If we are in the kingdom, our lives ought to center around, revolve around, worshiping and serving the king of the kingdom. Look what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.17. Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever. And oh, we started the service with worship the king. Worship the king. Worship the king. Listen, we don't need cheerleaders up on this platform trying to pump people up get them moved by the, the rhythm of the music we don't need cheerleaders we need folks just to realize when they are born again they are a subject of the king and the king is here blessed be his name the king is here hallelujah glory and honor and praise and dominion hallelujah that's all we need to realize we're subjects of the kingdom and he deserves our honor our praise our worship our respect our service Whatever praise we offer in the church building, we only truly worship the King if we live for Him during the week. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Young people, I'm not picking on you. I sense a great revival about to break out. So we make this about me. Every little problem that happens in our life will pull us down and discourage us and take us away from serving God. When it's about me, I get my feelings hurt. I'm out. If it's about me, I'm tempted one time and I go with it. But if it's about this kingdom, <laughs> oh, it's bigger than I am. And I'm thankful to be a part. I want to tell you, worship the king.
Worship the King. You don't need psychological therapy. You just need to worship the King. <laughs> how many can begin to sense what's going to happen if we just like never before worship the King? But I want to tell you, whatever you do at Southern Ohio, Camp Dove, Granite City, however you are expressive and demonstrative in a service there, that's great. That's wonderful. But you only truly worship the King when you live for Him during the week. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. You can march into the workplace. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the king. Hallelujah. Oh, advance this kingdom. Advance this come, come music, so I'll quit. Hallelujah. I don't come to church to see what I can get out of it or how it can please me. I come to church so that in the gathering of his subjects, I might join my heart, join my voice, join my praise with my fellow subjects and give honor and praise to the king that we serve. Through the parables, we're going to learn more about what the kingdom is about. Through the parables, we're going to learn more about the king. And through the parables, we're going to learn how to be better subjects. And through the parables, we're going to have a desire to see the kingdom grow and advance and expand. Hallelujah. Is this what you want? If this is what you desire, I want you to stand across this building. And as you stand, I just want to ask some quick questions. First of all, I'd like to ask, even are you in the kingdom this morning? Are you in the kingdom of Christ? If not, you are in the kingdom of darkness. You are in the kingdom of hopelessness. You are in the kingdom of destruction. But you don't have to leave here in that kingdom. Because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You might have entered this house in the kingdom of darkness. But you can leave in the kingdom of light. Is church to you just about you? Or is it about the kingdom? Are you seeking the kingdom or the other things? Are you seeking the kingdom or the other things? Are you worshiping the king? Oh, we live in hard times. But in hard times, the contrast only grows between those in the kingdom and those not. Hallelujah. Let's just praise Him. Come on, all across the field. I wish that every subject of the King would lift their hands and hearts and worship the King. He is worthy. I had other ways I wanted to close this, but I just feel impressed in my heart. You're trapped in that kingdom of darkness. You even struggle, but you can't get free. You can't get loose. That's because you can't on your own. But if you would call out to King Jesus, He would move the kingdom on heaven and earth to extract you from the power of darkness and bring you into His kingdom. Jesus, in whom we have redemption from sins. Hallelujah. Through His blood. If you're here this morning, you're not yet in the kingdom. You're just going to be honest. You say, I've not been born again. I'm not yet in the kingdom. You'd like to join, not this church, but you'd like to join the kingdom. You would like to become a part of the kingdom of Christ. I want to invite you to come. We use these stairs as a place to pray. I'd like to invite you to come right now and say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. God bless this young lady. Could some come and pray with her? Are there others you'd like to be a part of the kingdom? I'm not asking you to join a club. This isn't what this is about. I'm not asking you to just be a part of a certain organization. That's not what this is about. This is about being in the kingdom of Christ. And listen, I want to say it again. I'm not trying to be harsh or redundant. But if you're not in the kingdom of God this morning, you're in the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of destruction. The kingdom of hopelessness. You're here. You're not in the kingdom, but you'd like to be. Anyone else like to come across the building?
There are folks that will pray with you, be here with you as you seek the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are there others? Thank God some of these young folks are sensitive and are beginning to respond. But is there someone else here you just really like to be a part of the kingdom? Amen. God bless this young lady. Can we have some come pray with her this morning? Hallelujah. I'm still reaching. Listen, there's a battle going on right now. There's a battle going on right now. Satan's trying to hold on to someone, keep them in his kingdom, take them down when he goes down. But the Holy Spirit is here to rescue. I want you to pray to Jesus across this building right now. I want you to pray that somebody will let King Jesus come right into their situation. Extract them from the hold of Satan and bring them into His kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That appeal's still here, but if you're here this morning and you've caught the message... And you say, I'm tired of making this just about me, my feelings, my thoughts, what I, my preferences. I, I've caught it. I've caught it. It's about the kingdom. And I want to be a part of advancing the kingdom. I want to see revival come to Union Pentecostal Church so the young people's friends get saved. Amen. I want to see revival come to my workplace. I want to see revival come to my neighbor. I want to see the kingdom of God expanded and grow. Amen. If, if, if you've caught that message or the message caught you this morning, I want you to come right now. And say I want to be a part of that I'm tired of that other thing making it just about me I, w- I want to make it about the kingdom I want it to be about the kingdom I want to see folks get saved I want to see people get delivered I want to see folks set free I want to see marriages put back together I want to see homes restored hallelujah it's about the kingdom it's about the kingdom if you're here and you're not in the kingdom that appeal's still open amen come somebody will pray with you somebody will be here to help you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. 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 Lord. Oh, I surrender all. Just come and bow before the King. Come and bow before the King. Surrender all. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. (laughs) Oh, it'll carry you with it. The kingdom of God will take you with it. The kingdom of God will raise you with it. It's bigger than we are. Hallelujah. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. all. Oh, hallelujah. If I, by the Spirit of God, amen, bring those demons out, then is the kingdom of God coming to you. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come this morning. We pray that your kingdom would come. Oh, subjects of the King, let's seek Him this morning. Subjects of the King, let's seek Him. Those that are praying for Christ to move in their life, pray with Him till He takes Him and puts Him in His kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Let the kingdom of God come. Let the kingdom of God come to you. Let the kingdom of God come to you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 